Brindis, and I want to welcome all of you for coming this afternoon. We're thrilled to have you here. And on behalf of the Center of Excellence on Women's Health, the um, UC Hastings Consortium on Law, Science, and Policy, the Bixby Center on Reproductive Health Policy, or Reproductive Health, the Program on Building, Building Interdisciplinary Careers in Women's Health, and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies, to this session that we've called, What's at Stake? Assessing Women's Health Access to Reproductive Health Services. And I'm really thrilled about the wonderful panel that I'll have an opportunity to introduce to you. There's a little bit of housekeeping. There are powder rooms or bathrooms outside. The orange piece of paper will give you the code. There is also going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. I know that there are so many experts in the room and you will have an opportunity to make comments and we will have a mic for you. We are taping today's session so that this will be also available to you in the near future. And the final is that after we're done with our session, that there are uh, treats for you. We'll ask you to move some of the chairs in the back and have an opportunity for networking. So as we are speaking about this topic, I think it's really important that as I was sharing with our panel members, just preparing remarks for today, we are living in a time of such turmoil. And we have to understand the context in which these decisions are being made. Just as we meet tonight in Washington, D.C., a number of Republican senators are meeting to try to reconcile and planning for a vote next week. And I see that we've gone from a repeal to re and replace to a repeal and delay, or trust us, to a retain and destroy mechanism. So we are very deeply concerned about the fact that no matter what the outcomes are, we have to be vigilant about the fact that any changes in the Obamacare or the ACA will have profound impact on women's health. So the lens today is really on women's reproductive health, but we also are knowledgeable about the fact that this changing landscape really will have an impact on so many people. And we need to recognize how these rapid changes, we need to be able to monitor and be on top of them. At the same time, I want to celebrate the progress that we've made on behalf of women. Under the ACA, there has been a major success story around how many women have been able to access reproductive health services without co-payment. 55 million in the year 2016. That is a huge win. The fact that essential benefits covered maternity care and reproductive health services and preventive health care services and breast pumps, all of that have been successful, successes. At the same time, we recognize that we're living in a time of tremendous turmoil and just the last few weeks, not only have there been attacks within what's going to happen around health care insurance reform, but also attacks on Title X with the potential of elimination of Title X once again, and also elimination of $213 million worth of programs, 80 of these programs across the country that are dedicated to getting adolescents and young adults with the type of information and knowledge that they need. And the truncation of this funding, potential redeployment of the dollars towards um, abstinence-only programs is also a, a dangerous zone for us. So I want to um, introduce to you our panel and to share with you that what we will do is I've asked each of our panel members to speak about 10 minutes. They could speak with their expertise for a lot longer. And we've tried to create a kaleidoscope for you. Um, and to really give each of them an opportunity to give them their vantage point. And um, Alina Salginikov will begin uh, by giving you the overall big picture view at the 30,000 foot view. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Alina for many years. Uh, we served on the IOM committee that made the recommendation to the federal government around eliminating co-payment for contraceptives. And as many of you know, she is the vice president and director of women's health policy at Kaiser Family Foundation. So Alina, if you'd like to start. I just want to clarify that I work for the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is not 
to be confused with Kaiser Permanente. We share the same family name, and um, we work on healthcare, um, though be it very differently. We're a healthcare information organization. Um, I just wanted to make that clear. Um, this is really the most critical time, I think, right now for all of us to be informed and engaged about what's going on, um, both in Washington and here in our own states and here in our communities, because there, as Claire said, there really is so much at stake. And I think the intersection of women's health, sexual and reproductive health, and now healthcare policy has really um, just never been so crystal clear, I think, to, to all of us who work in the field. Um, I honestly, like today, I, I had five different lists of what I was going to talk to you about um, as the day progressed. As Claire said, it's not really clear what's going to happen. I think many of us want to believe that, the th that it's just an impossible needle to thread in Washington to get this repeal through. Um, they've tried and tried, but they're meeting again today, and whether we're going to have some version of the repeal and destroy, repeal and replace, repeal and delay. Um, what that does mean is, at the end of the day is we are really looking at um, a very uh, complicated and challenging situation, and particularly when it comes to reproductive health care. So I, like Claire said, I think it really is important for us to step back for a second and recognize that we have made a lot of improvements. And in addition to the accomplishments of the Affordable Care Act, you know, we've seen teen births and teen pregnancy rates and abortion rates really drop significantly over the years. Um, and we've seen improvements in terms of coverage of maternity care. We no longer have allow plans to really have discriminatory practices against women, saying you can't cover maternity care. We came very close to losing that, and we'll see where that happens, and we can talk about that later. Um, but we have also first dollar coverage for a wide range of preventive services and not just people who have coverage through um, the Affordable Care Act, but all of us through our employer plans. And that's really, really a critical and very important change. And so on the other hand, we have some um, changes that I, some still many remaining challenges. And I would say, that even though the teen births are down, we have unacceptably high rates, and the maternal mortality um, situation in our country is tragic. And if you haven't seen the ProPublica piece that Nina Martin did, I highly recommend that you check that out. It is heartbreaking, and it is a problem that I think that really we have to really address in this country. And at the same time, also, we've seen the STI rates also increase. And so those are really big challenges. And we have enormous still health care disparities that I think that really, really need to continue to be addressed. So um, there's still a lot to be done. We can feel good about some things. So you know, what the heck is going on in DC? Um, and so I want to kind of, I think that what I want to try to do a little bit is try to unpeel at least some of the layers of the onion. I think a big part of this is what's happening around the Affordable Care Act, or at least that's what sucked up a lot of the oxygen. And so I think that one of the things that, you know, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, losing the essential health benefits, about losing um, basically regulation of insurance, which is what, deregulation of insurance, which is what the intent is of the Republican plans. They've been very clear about that. They don't believe that there should be this level of regulation. The Democrats have a very different view and believe in the, the importance and the strength of regulation. They don't, there is a disagreement about the federal role of financing. But one of the things that we've really seen um, consistently throughout all of these um, different iterations is a real constraint on abortion coverage. And um, that's an area where they are really taking the um, choices around abortion coverage even away from the states. And that's a big, you know, everything else they want to, the Republicans are eager to give the states the right. But when it comes to abortion coverage, that is not the case. And even, it's interesting, today's um, version of the straight repeal is actually not a straight repeal because they have lifted language from the BCRA, the Senate plan, to basically say you cannot use tax credits to buy a um, to buy a plan that includes abortion coverage, 
So that puts women, and we can maybe talk about that, women in California where you have to have, your plans have to have abortion coverage in a difficult place, but it also across the country would vastly limit the ability of insurance to cover abortion. And that is going to be a pattern that I think we're going to see even if we, as we look to the fixes to the Affordable Care Act, where I can easily see where they have the cost sharing, um, the CSR, the cost sharing reductions, which are basically the money that the federal government is giving to the plans to offset cost sharing for low income people, um, that could easily be tied to or limited to um, payments to plans that don't cover abortion. So that is something I think that we're really going to have to continue to watch very closely. I think the other area that hasn't gotten as much attention is, which Claire alluded to, which is the issue of what kind of administrative action can the Trump administra administration take unilaterally. Um, we heard a lot about the contraceptive coverage, and that was a really huge victory, but it was also the, at the heart of two Supreme Court cases, the Hobby Lobby and the Zubik case. The the, Trump has issued an executive order basically saying that the administration needs to come up with a, a plan to basically accommodate uh, organizations that have a moral or religious objection to contraception. They are working on these rules. There was a leaked rule that came out that was extremely far-reaching and would basically allow any employer who has an objection to either limit their coverage of some or all methods of contraception, and particularly um, the focus has been really on IUDs and emergency contraceptives, which um, the, the, many of the folks who are opposed to contraception really link to and equate with abortion. So that's an, uh, an area that you're going to see some more, and we can talk about that maybe during the questions. And then the other is the point that, that Claire made, and I would say that the other issue that's come out of Title X that I've been hearing about is that the Title X agencies that get the federal money to distribute to the family planning clinics, the contracts that are up for renewal instead of for three years, those are now one-year contract renewals. And so that is extremely burdensome and difficult for the family planning agencies to do, and then for the family planning clinics to apply. And then finally, I think that one of the areas that I think we really need to pay attention to is the budget, both the Trump administration budget and what's coming out of the House. The Trump administration didn't end Title X. They funded Title X, but there was a lot of language there saying, you can have Title X, but no money can go to Planned Parenthood. Um, through Title X, that's going to be a ridiculously difficult challenge here in California. I'm on the board of Essential Access Health, which is the Title X agency. Here in California, there's over 1.1 million women who get uh, reproductive health services at Title X clinics. In California, 800,000 of them go to Planned Parenthoods. We are going to have a really big problem with our family planning network in the state if that actually happens. So that is um, extremely worrisome. I think that the other issue is around um, what we're likely to see around support for abstinence education as well. I think there's a lot of interest. I was reading an article where some of the Trump administration staff had previously talked about sex, you know, medically accurate sex education as pro-sex education. So I think that that's an area where we're going to see a lot of support. And also then, I think the other issue is around the kind of money that's going to be available to CDC to continue its work, um, monitoring what's happening and supporting programs, and also for the NIH. So um, I want to end on a slightly good note, which is the polling that Kaiser has done has really shown that the public is very supportive of funding family planning services for low-income women. We found that three-quarters of the population, and that's majorities of Republicans and Democrats, support the government role in financing family planning services for low-income women. Similarly, we have, I think it's two-thirds, strongly support funding for Planned Parenthood. And then you have another, I think, 20 percent actually have you know, they feel it's somewhat important. So I think that we do have actually very strong support from the public for these programs. So I think that getting the message out that this is out of the mainstream and this is different than what the public support is going to be really important. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to oh, to Joe. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Alina, for that uh, sobering 
but important overview. And now we wanted to sort of part of our kaleidoscope with you all is to have Jennifer Templeton Dunn, who is a lecturer in law at UC Hastings um, School of Law, one of our partners in the UC, UCSF uh, Hastings Consortium. And Jennifer will take this conversation and really give you a bird's eye view of what's happening with California and what are the implications for California and then what are the checks and balances within our state around reproductive health? I'm, a, um, as, as Claire said, I'm a, a law professor. I'm also a lawyer. I'm used to talking with clinics. I'm talking with hospitals and providers about what the law actually is. I'm used to talking with um, my law students and informing them so that we can find out and figure out what the law is and what these Supreme Court cases mean. So I was asked to um, discuss, OK, so what's happening with the proposals from the GOP? and the impact on California. And it reminded me, I was talking to somebody outside um, just a little while ago, it reminded me of this game in the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk called Whack-A-Mole, right? I'm thinking, okay, I've got to figure out how this applies to California. So we have the um, House's version. Okay, so we got that one. We have the Senate, and then we have the Senate's version, and it's version one, it's version two. Then we have the effort to repeal and replace and now we have all of these other pieces that are also going on at this point. So I wanted to focus on um, two pieces that seem consistent throughout with a lot of the proposals that we've been hearing. The first one would be um, some type of um, reduction in Medicaid funding for the, um, for the Affordable Care Act. Um, that would either be through a reduction in the Medicaid expansion program, it would be through the per capita um, caps on spending, it could also be through the block grants, but all of these result in some type of a reduction of Medicaid funding to the state and therefore Medicaid, Medi-Cal funding um, within our state coffers. Um, and the second is what Alina had started to talk about, which is the attacks on Planned Parenthood and the attempts to defund Planned Parenthood, not necessarily, uh, or not um, defund them related to abortion services, because this is already prohibited. We cannot put um, federal funding toward abortion services, but this is federal funding for Medicaid. It's federal funding for um, cancer screenings, for family planning services, for STI, uh, sexually transmitted infection um, treatment and, um, and testing. So what I'd like to do is start with um, looking at California and where we are today, where we are under the Affordable Care Act, where we are um, legislatively and proactively um, within our state. Um, and I will look at some, legis some of the legislation that's been passed in California to try and shore up the Affordable Care Act provisions, some legislation in California that has also um, gone beyond what we have in the federal legislation in order to expand coverage for women in California, and then look at how these two pieces of um, the um, GOP proposals um, could potentially impact us here in California. So um, I wanted to look at um, a couple of our um, pieces of legislation in California. I want to focus, since there's a limited amount of time, on um, maternity care and on um, sex education and access to family planning. Um, we in California, particularly at this time in California, have the political will, we have the legislative will, we have the public health initiatives that are focused and supportive of expanding um, health services for women in California and promoting access to very comprehensive reproductive health services in California. We have had um, uh, a number of health-related bills. We also have a lot of the politicians in California who, unlike many of the other states, want to go and want to talk on the news, want to put on their voice, um, Facebook and their websites that they have um, signed that 25 pieces of um, health care legislation relating to women, or they have signed seven bills to support health and well-being of women in California. So we have seen a lot of very proactive, progressive 
uh, legislation in California in recent years um, that are promoting access to women's health. Um, two of those pieces that we have, um, the first one is, that I want to cover, um, the first one is the coverage of prenatal care and the requirement in California that insurance companies cover prenatal services. This is something that was not here in the past. It's something that when we were under uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, he did um, veto that bill along with um, vetoing um, single payer in 2006 and 2008. Um, but he vetoed, vote, vetoed this legislation to um, require insurance companies to cover prenatal care. Um, subsequently, the Affordable Care Act, when it was passed, it made it a requirement that prenatal care would be, we'd be covered without a, deduct, without a copay and um, without having to meet the deductible. So California then took that and they um, codified this in California law. So even if they remove this language somehow, which isn't currently um, on the table, but even if they remove the language, it would still be um, part of California law. In California, we also have uh, laws um, promoting comprehensive access to sex, um, to, sorry, to sex education, <laughs> to sex, right, to sex education and family planning. Um, and we have um, the uh, contraceptive, I was going to, I'm going to talk about sex education later. First I'll talk about contraceptive act access. Um, and we did have coverage, the Contraceptive Equity Act, this ha we had this passed in California before we had um, the requirement under the Affordable Care Act. And subsequent to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, um, we amended it and shorted it up and expanded it beyond what we have under the Affordable Care Act. So in California, we have um, the requirement that um, insurance companies cover all methods of contraception, not just a sampling of each type of contraception. We also have the requirement with some um, very significant exceptions that women have access to a full year's worth of um, of contraceptives. So these are in California. We've codified these in California law. We, so we have this political will in California to um, continue to promote women's health, to, to continue to promote um, access to reproductive health services. We also have the public health community um, who, with public health initiatives that are focusing on women's health. Um, two of those that I want to talk about are the um, California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. Um, this is what actually many of you might be familiar with. I see a lot of familiar faces. How many people are familiar with that collaborative? Okay, so we have a few of you. Because um, I see some people in here that actually first talked with me about that collaborative. Um, when we looked at the maternal mortality rates in California in 2006, they were appalling. I mean, we had, the United States was shockingly high. We were higher than any other developed country, but California was, was even higher. And in 2006, they began this collective, starting with medical schools, starting with the state of California, and expanding that to include professional associations, to include um, hospitals, and starting to develop more of a focus on looking at evidence-based care for maternity care, and what can we do in order to decrease this maternal mortality rate. So at this point, um, from 2006 to 2013, California decreased their maternal mortality rate by 55%, which is pretty um, significant, particularly since the United States maternal mortality rate has actually increased and doubled. Um, and to compare it to Texas, um, and I, I, anybody from Texas? Okay, just a couple, yeah? I'm not going to pick on them too much, but in my original version, which was longer, Texas came in a, a few more times. But Texas's rate is five times that of the rate in California. It is one of the most dangerous places to give birth in a developed country. Um, and they also rejected um, the Medicaid expansion. Um, they have attempted to shut down Planned Parenthood clinics, and they've certainly defunded them. And the last I looked, they also had the largest population of uninsured 
um, in the United States. I'm not saying that these are the only reasons for this, but we're looking at a different um, political will, a different driver than we have in California as far as access to comprehensive reproductive health. Um, I'm realizing I might be um, running low on time, so I'm going to speed it up and just say the other example that I have is on adolescent health um, and access to comprehensive, um, comprehensive sex education and um, access to family planning, and that we also recognize this as a very important priority for California, um, because we, in 1991, um, we had a rate that was double the national average. We have been focusing on um, um, shoring up our sex education. We have ha passed legislation. I think we have several people in here who have been involved in passing that legislation in order to have um, comprehensive, culturally appropriate sex education in our schools. Um, we have also um, refused federal funding where it was tied to abstinence-only um, abstinence -only education. And we have significantly decreased our um, teen pregnancy rate, and from 1991 to 2011, it declined by 60%. Um, it also dropped nationwide, but that was more at the range of about 37 percent. So we've significantly um, decreased our, um, our um, uh, teen pregnancy rate. Um, so I'm going to actually speed it up and just go quickly into, um, there's so much, I mean, talking about the impact of California. Um, and looking at the two GOP proposals, the decrease in Medicaid funding um, and the um, a provision to defund Planned Parenthood for one year, the first one, how it will impact us is that we will still have these laws on the books. We will still have all of these initiatives. The problem we're going to be having is paying for it because all of these different um, proposals propose to cut the federal funding to the states and would significantly hurt our Medi-Cal program and would significantly hurt um, our federally funded programs in, in California. And so we may have the political will, but we will be having to look at, do we have to take people, um, some people who have now been, become eligible for Medi-Cal, like my nephews and my niece, and take it back and not have them covered anymore, or are we going to have to limit the coverage that we have under our Medi-Cal program, are we going to still be able to have all of these proactive public health initiatives that so many of you that I see in this room have been involved in, or do we have to somehow cut them and which ones are we going to be cutting? I'm not going to talk about um, Planned Parenthood and the impact in California. Um, I'll save that in case there are any questions about that, um, but um, this is something that we do have um, California Planned Parenthoods are a very important part of our safety net, and defunding them, taking away federal dollars, will drastically, uh, will really um, hurt Planned Parenthood and a lot of the women across California. Well, these are very important topics, so we understand. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, to finish the panel, but not, she's certainly not the caboose to the panel. She is a giant in the field. She's short, but she's a giant in the field is uh, Jane Garcia, who's the CEO of La Clinica de Raza. She's one of the most respected providers who runs a very outstanding organization. And we thought it was important for you to also get a sense of what's going on at the clinic level and how, is, um, how did the ACA affect her program, but also what are the potential ramifications and some of the experiences she's had from a patient's perspective. Uh, it's good to be here with you today. Uh, so, La Clinica is uh, part of the safety net. Uh, we just celebrated our 46th anniversary. Uh, we're a pretty significant uh, clinic. We're pretty large in the Bay Area. Uh, we have 34 locations uh, in three counties, Alameda, Contra Costa, and Solano, and uh, do quite a bit of school-based health centers as well. We have eight uh, throughout those three counties. Needless to say, we do extensive uh, family planning services and uh, we are also a very big prenatal uh, care service. Uh, last year we saw about 85,000 patients throughout the three counties, and uh, we provided almost 360,000 visits. Um, we do a variety of services in addition to women's health. 
uh, including, of course, primary care, dentistry, optometry, behavioral health, pharmacy, radiology, health education. Um, but 60% of the people that we serve are women and uh, providing specific services uh, to address women's needs, therefore, is a very important part of the work we do, including uh, serving trans women. And we're really happy about uh, the fact that this is kind of a new service for us. And I think with all the attention that we've gotten to equality in marriage and a number of other services, we are seeing a larger number of trans women who, are we, who we are serving as part of our health center. 42% um, of the people that we serve are women. And um, the majority of them are between 30, 13 and 44, so they're in the, they're in the reproductive age. 34% uh, of our patients are 12 years of age or younger, so a lot of children as well. We do uh, quite a bit of family planning, I think probably uh, about 20,000 visits, and probably the only other service that we see more of is diabetes-related <laughs> services. Um, we are uh, a state program for family planning, uh, and that's also primarily uh, funded through Medicaid. I just uh, heard here today that uh, Title X is potentially on the chopping block, and that would be very, very bad news for us. Um, we do about 1,500 babies. We deliver about 1,500 babies a, a year, and we do quite a bit of pre and post uh, prenatal care, as well as a lot of cervical cancer screening. Um, a huge majority of our women are covered by Medi-Cal and Family Pact. Uh, and by the way, if you don't, didn't know this, but nationwide, half of all the deliveries are covered uh, by Medicaid. So this is not just an issue that's uh, specific to, to the clinics here in the Bay Area, but also nationwide. Um, Publicly funded fa family planning centers, including community health centers, helped avert uh, over 300,000 uh, un unintended pregnancies in 2014. And I think in 2015 and 16, those numbers were even higher. We like to remind folks that uh, for every dollar that is invested in family planning, there is a $10 return. So a um, very nice return on investment. And um, if these services are cut, there is no question that you will see it pop up uh, somewhere else. In whole, uh, the community health centers, uh, and us in particular, um, we were great beneficiaries of the Affordable Care Act. We greatly supported it, and uh, it helped us by reducing our uninsured rate. Um, by it, we had almost a 75% uninsured rate, and it helped reduce it by at least 25%. So that was a big uh, boost to us, and um, it, that's a really big deal, uh, especially right now when um, you know we struggle to figure out how to pay for technology, um, uh, the recruitment for workforce is very intense uh, right now. And so being able to shift some of our uninsured patients to insured category uh, was a big uh, boost for us. But even so, um, we serve a big, big immigrant community. And for some of our other sister clinics, some of them are running as much as 90% Medicaid. So that's really very, very good news. Um, obviously, uh, losing uh, the Affordable Care Act would um, have some very negative uh, implications for us and for our patients. Uh, as you heard here today, though, even uh, if we're somehow able to save the Affordable Care Act, I think we have to be vigilant and continue to keep an eye out because this death by a thousand cuts is really something we have to look at. And the budget is a big, big item. And there are many, many ways to undermine the Affordable Care Act short of repealing it. And I think we will have to be uh, vigilant about uh, making sure that, um, that we are ready for the resistance in that area. Um, these cuts, of course, and if we lose the Affordable Care Act, would disproportionately affect women uh, because women disproportionately make up the ranks of the Medicaid population. And this is because more, we're more likely than men to be in low-paying jobs that don't offer health insurance. We're often the ones that are at home uh, with children and seniors, and sometimes children and seniors all at the same time. 
And uh, particularly during reproductive years, I don't have to tell you that uh, we have a need for more services in this period. In California in 2014, 53% uh, of the women who were in need of publicly funded contraceptive services were Latinas. And, you know, in, as I uh, look at uh, the repeal of the Affordable Act, and, you know, I think that um, certainly women are under attack. There's no question in my mind. When I see the negotiations that are going on and you see who's in the room, it's all white men. And I don't have anything against white men. But golly, more than 50% of us are women, and we are absent in those rooms. And certainly, in terms of women of color, you, see, you don't see any women of color in the room. And that's just wrong. Um, La Clinica alone would stand to lose over $13 million uh, through, the, through the elimination of the Medi-Cal expansion program. And that's just the expansion program. If they do block granting, which is usually code for cuts, and we lose another 20%, we're looking in the range of you know, possibly as high as $30 million. And there's no question that uh, we'd have to close services, that we'd have to cut the number of people that we could uh, serve. Be I had mentioned earlier that uh, we do a lot of, provide a lot of services in uh, the schools. And I think if uh, we lost the Affordable Care Act, you would see, there's no question that you would see the pregnancy rate amongst our teens drastically improve, uh, improve increase. Um, so losing this amount, even over four years, is, uh, would, not, uh, would not be a good thing. And you know, I, we are already seeing uh, the negative impacts even uh, just at the threat, and particularly with uh, the immigrant community, they've been petrified uh, to come in and receive services. I, I kid you not, the day after uh, the election, we had people in the waiting room just absolutely in tears, and that was beyond the staff. We were mortified, but the patients in our waiting room were just absolutely uh, terrified. And I, there's just no question we would lose some people I have a, a board member, and she's a, uh, she's a librarian, and she's an English um, learner teacher at the library. She volunteers and you know, d does that uh, out of the kindness of her heart. And just recently, uh, the, a young man that had been part of the class, and he hadn't been there in five months, uh, showed up. And as she was talking to him, uh, she learned that he had a new baby. He had a five-month-old baby. And as they talked, she found out this baby was born at home. He had yet to be seen by a doctor, five months old. And you know, this story ends, it, it, it has a good ending. We were able to get him into services, provide the vaccinations and all of that. But by stroke of luck, that he ran into somebody that could connect him to the safety net and was able to help him that way. Just recently, I was talking to one of our nurse practitioners, and she told me about a Nigerian woman who walked in 37 weeks pregnant. And it was, you know, she was ready to, to deliver any, any moment. And she had not been seeking services because she was afraid. Uh, by the way, we're federally funded, and we are um, um, incentivized to uh, help people into prenatal care as early as we can. So actually taking women in at 37, week, at 37 weeks, like we did, actually hurts us. But it's the right thing to do, and we continue to do it. Um, so these are, these are the kinds of service, uh, stories that are surfacing more and more. Um, and I, the other part, I think, is that you know, we've made a lot of advances in the system itself, in the delivery system. And more and more, not just La Clinica, but other community health centers are, have been seeing um, more formal relationships with hospitals, with the health plants, with the counties. And all of these... Um, Formal relationships are about formalizing the handoff from one system to the other. And what we're seeing is that as a result of this and of this work, um, we're actually seeing ha and having an impact and decreasing people showing up at the emergency room. We're uh, having some great improvements in terms of uh, diabetes control and other things like that because we're coordinating services across systems. So if we're undermined by losing our base funding uh, like the threat currently is, uh, it would have no question in my mind 
an increase in the cost of services, and you would uh, definitely uh, see, see that happening. Um, immediately post-election, as I said, uh, we uh, saw a pretty drastic uh, decline in, um, in our services. I think uh, uh, at one point, uh, the rumor was that ICE was in the neighborhood. And I think we were able to find out there was actually a park ranger. But in one, and the, ru the rumor just spread, I couldn't believe how fast it spread. It cleared out the clinic. And these are the things that we're seeing on a daily basis. And it's because we've seen it before, right? Prop 187. And we've seen uh, the word would get out that there was an immigration person or a car over at one of the schools, and people would just run uh, terrified. And uh, so those are the things that we're seeing. We're seeing a definite increase in the number of women who are coming in uh, with depression. The children are highly impacted, clinging on to moms. They don't want to go to school. We have a, a trauma support group that we do. Half the women in that group told us they were no longer sending their kids to school because they were afraid of being separated. Um, we've got a lot of women coming in and asking for long-lasting contraceptive uh, contraception because they don't intend to come back. Um, and so particularly for our mixed immigration status families and women make the decisions often about that. Uh, and even when the children are legitimately eligible for Medicaid and others in the family, some of our patients, a lot of our patients are deciding not to uh, use their Medicaid to actually turn it down because they're afraid of the implications of that for the rest of their family. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our families aren't able to distinguish either between uh, a Medicaid program and a program that Alameda County might be uh, offering for, um, for uninsured, and we're big providers of those services. And so it's having an impact way beyond Medicaid and family pact. Uh, CalFresh is a perfect example. It's already got a stigma, and uh, we're experiencing a much higher reluctance uh, from patients to apply for that. And uh, WIC is absolutely in the same boat, and it's affecting disproportionately uh, young children. Even as I was on my way over here, I was hearing on NPR uh, that SNAP, uh, the, the food uh, assistance program, is on the chopping block in this budget. And, as I was hearing the legislator that was uh, cheering this on as a good thing, he talked about how we shouldn't uh, judge our compassion by the number of people that are on these safety net programs, but by how many of them um, we free up and, 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 uh, uh, and not uh, have them dependent on these jobs on these programs. Well, you know, when you got a lot of money, that's really easy for you to say. But uh, I don't know that you can say no raise in the minimum wage and also get off SNAP. You know, and those things are related and um, we're seeing it in our patients. Um, we saw a big increase in the number of patients that are coming in uh, to have us help them answer questions about the, their coverage. Lots of confusion about that. And with all the discussion about the, or the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, uh, there's still, there's a lot of confusion about whether the program is active or not. Just to give you an example, um, last year we helped 17,000 people come in and we helped them uh, with insurance questions and helping them get insured, et cetera. Uh, in 10 months already, we've had 22,000 people come in and there's so much confusion about what's available and what isn't and what uh, the implications of that are. Uh, it's worth, repeal, uh, worth also noting that the repeal of the Affordable, uh, Affordable Care Act is also projected to have a severe impact on the economy. We're going to lose jobs. More than 290,000 jobs are going to be lost, and that's the, that's the projection for, for the GDP and uh, 1.5 billion in uh, lost state and local tax revenues. And this is going to hurt us um, because it will have a big uh, impact on workforce, and uh, that's already depleted. In healthcare, women are disproportionately represented in those positions nurses, medical assistants, dental assistants, 
uh, home health aides, those are a lot of women that are in those positions, and we will be the ones that are hurt by those kinds of decisions. La Clinica itself is probably close to 80%, if not higher, women. Girl power. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, even if, um, the, even if the Affordable Care Act has not been repealed, we are already feeling its impact because of the rhetoric, because of the talk that's out there. So I, I uh, do, do share with you that we're determined by hook or by crook that services will continue for our patients, and I'm uh, glad to be here to share uh, the story and what's happening on the ground level. <clears throat> So thank you very much. And now I'd like to open it up for some questions, and then we'll have some ending remarks. Hi, my name is Annika Ehrlich. I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, question about funding streams in California and what the plan is for that. Is there any thought or um, no, what, what do we know about what kind of funding we have independent of federal funding? Um, I, I think that there, you know, so it really depends on the program when you say the funding streams. The state of California, through Medi-Cal, through Family Pact, and through many of the other programs, we are highly dependent on federal funds to match um, the program, the the revenues, the, the state revenues that go in. So it's kind of hard to answer that question. I think that there is, you know, I was just at this town hall meeting on uh, Saturday that Jackie Spear had, and you know, I think that that Jennifer was making, I think there is a lot of political will here in California to do it, but really the numbers don't work and I think that, you know, our policymakers are going to have to, if, if we get to this situation, we're going to have to make some very difficult trade-offs, you know, around funding streams for education, you know, higher education, corrections, I mean, these are all very real um, uh, Pro programs that, um, that we need to support in the state, and we are highly reliant on federal funds, even though a lot of the, fun the, the tax dollars from California do go um, to, uh, to Washington and then come back. So I just think that there's just not a way that we could compensate for the devastating losses, particularly uh, around if we lose Medi-Cal, and um, that's just that's just a reality here. And I, so I think there's a will, but we have to kind of, they're either going to have to, you know, we, we talk about the, the flexibility. People have been talking about, you know, capping Medicaid will give you flexibility. Yes, it will give you flexibility to cut provider payments, <laughs> to cut services or cut eligibility or raise taxes. And those are the, that's the situation that California and other states are going to have to be in if we're in that position. There is currently legislation sitting on the Senate desk regarding the single payer proposal. And I'm wondering to what, I know it's been tried in the past and never was signed or anything. And, uh, but I'm wondering to what extent can any of you who have ties to Sacramento and such, how do you feel that might go? Uh, what you identified is the political will. I think there is an interest by most Californians in having universal coverage here having some way that we have, we scoop up, although we have drastically reduced the number of un uninsured, going from 17 to 7 percent in California, we still have that 7 percent. Um, and the will is there, but the issue, I, I do believe, is funding. So trying to find out how that will be funded, um, figuring out how, look, perhaps looking at other countries. I know we've mostly, with a single pair, looked at how Canada um, at Canada and our Medicare system, but perhaps also looking at other countries and looking at how they do it under the Bismarck system, which is a combination of public, um, public payer um, and private insurance and very heavily, heavily regulated private insurance and only with nonprofit um, insurance companies. So there are a lot of other types of models to also look at. So um, this was an issue that came up also at the town hall meeting, um, and there was a lot of anger in the room around the fact that the, the sickle payer had been tabled um, here in California. And I, I mean, it was, I think that it's, it's very complicated. I think it's very challenging to do. I understand they have to do, make some even constitutional changes around funding streams, and there's a lot of, we don't know about what's going to happen to Washington, and, and the money really 
it really matters. Um, and I think that we can stand on principle, and I think a lot of people in California would support a kind of Medicare for all model, I suppose. Um, but I think that we haven't really seen a full-throated campaign against that we might see against the insurance industry. I mean, when you think about when we passed Medicare in this country, the insurance industry and healthcare was actually not nearly as um, an enormous part. I mean, you know, it's a one-sixth of our GNP, and we have this challenge where you want a, the economy to grow, but you want a health care cost to go down, and that, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. So I think that there is, as I say, I think there's political will um, and an interest, and I think that uh, there are many people who are looking at this as an opportunity to really expand that, and I think that it's kind of amazing because it is back. You know, people are talking about it, and people are talking about it in Washington, and I think starting to have that conversation is an important start, but I think over the long term, I think it, it's going to be really challenging. Hi, Jenna. I do communications for a number of nonprofits, including Planned Parenthood, so thank you for all of your shout outs and support. Um, you talked a little bit about religious refusal through Hobby Lobby and other insurance, you know, bans on abortion coverage. Can you talk a little bit about religious refusal in the Catholic hospital system and sort of the growth of religious refusals, specifically in California? If you can just shed a little bit of light on that, because I think it's not talked about enough. <laughs> if we are talking about what's happening in California, um, the ACLU actually has been bringing some lawsuits against um, some of the religious hospitals who have not only, it's not only that they're denying um, abortions or denying a DNC um, when there are, um, after uh, fetal demise, but denying patients who have just given birth being able to have um, a tubal ligation. And so we have been able to be more proactive in California, and we have a few people from the ACLU here and they have filed some cases. Um, generally, what I've been seeing is that um, as the individual cases, you might get some action, um, and, but not necessarily across the board at this point. We also, if you're looking at Hobby Lobby and contraceptive equity, which is slightly different than um, patients that are seen within a religious hospital, um, the um, religious uh, refusals, the, re um, the ability to be um, exempted out of the requirement of providing contraception for your employees um, under, the feder under federal law um, is different than in California, and our California law is much narrower and much more confined to religious entities rather than con um, also encompassing a private employer such as Hobby Lobby who does not believe that their employees should be able to access birth control on their employees. I do want to add, though, that when we're talking about what's happening at the federal level, you know, California is able to regulate plans that are bought and sold in this state, but a lot of people have their coverage through these self-insured plans. Those are regulated by the federal government, so that the really important thing about the Affordable Care Act was that it affected not only, um, you know, the, the not only the individual insurance market, but it reached out to the self-funded plans that are regulated by ERISA. Um, and so that's, that would be um, a trade-off here in the state. They wouldn't be able to really affect those plans. Similarly with the, um, the contraceptive equity law that we have, it would affect all of the kind of small and individual plan policies, but the self-funded plans could do what they, they wish. Now, just to be clear, like even before the Affordable Care Act, you know, the vast majority of insurance did cover contraception but they didn't cover it with, um, without cost sharing, and they didn't cover each of the 18 methods. So, you know, to see what would what happen, we've been trying to think about at, at the Kaiser Family Foundation how we start to track, you know, some of that activity that's likely to happen. Here and in the back. Okay. Uh, Mike Pollock, our OBGYN at uh, San Francisco General. So um, just to add to the list of all the things that we have to worry about, uh, two people that we haven't talked about so far are Teresa Manning and Tom Price. So just to remind you, Tom Price is the Secretary for Health and Human Services. Um, one of the offices that he runs is CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and all of Family PAC program, all of Family PAC in California and the 26 other state family planning programs are all basically kind of funded, operated, 
out of CMS as well as being co-funded by the state. So we're really concerned about some of the regulations that CMS might come up with that's going to have an impact on state family planning programs, including family PAC. Not only the dollars that they get, but other sorts of restrictions that might happen. Teresa Manning, on the other hand, is the new DASPA. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs. That's the person who's responsible for the Title X program. And even if Title X is not zeroed out or drastically cut back in its funding, what we're really worried about in the short term, and here we're talking about months, is that they may sort of try to revisit some of the things that happened during the Reagan years. One of the things in particular was called the domestic gag rule, where in federally funded family planning programs like all of the Title X funded programs, when a woman is found to have a positive pregnancy test, she can only be told about going to term or adoption. She can't even be told about the option of abortion, which is what makes it a gag rule, just like they've already applied internationally. So I think that's something we really have got to keep our eyes open for, and that's just a matter of months. If something happens to the ACA and Medicaid, God forbid, that is going to be years in the implementation. But in, in the short term, we also have to watch out what's happening in CMS and in the OPA. Um, hi, Kate Frischer with Breast Cancer Action. Um, so I know that California was one of the first states to implement over-the-counter birth control, and many organizations have since moved away from proposing similar legislation nationwide. So I'm wondering what, if any, downsides or impacts you've seen from having that implemented in California um, and plans to address that going forward. The whole provision of family planning is undergoing some really dramatic changes that are even outside of the context of um, what's happening in the kind of political front, just in terms of increased access to contraception without a prescription. You have, now you have um, apps that do it here in California. Um, you are able to get it through a pharmacy. I mean, I couldn't believe it when the CBS, I mean, when the Safeway had a big sign that said you can get your birth control pill here without a doctor's prescription. I think more and more we're going to see, and eventually even I think the FDA have start to approve certain methods for a certain con oral contraceptives over the counter. I think there are a number of challenges that have been happening to freestanding family planning clinics that we don't require or recommend. Women get a pap smear every year, now every three years, we, a lot more women are going, getting long-acting methods, some maybe that don't necessarily want them, but many women who do and who value, you know, not having to take a pill every day. And so I think that the, we, we're seeing the numbers of Title X visits, the family planning visits fall overall. Part of it could be related to funding, but part of it is to really changes in kind of how women are using contraception and standard in medical practice. And I think that those are realities that, the, that all of us are going to have to think about in terms of how do we set up a system that really most effectively meets women's needs. And so, you know, on one hand, we really want to integrate, many of us, uh, reproductive health services into family planning and not have it so that women have to make separate visits. But we also want to make sure that primary care offers women the best quality family planning services. And we know that those services are, um, in many cases, sensitive and you need certain uh, training uh, to do the counseling and also the clinics need to be able to offer the full range of services to women. And so those trade-offs I think are going to be um, ongoing challenges to family planning providers beyond what's happening in the kind of political context. I do want to just close because I know we're, we're feeling really, it's getting kind of depressing. Um, but a lot of what's been happening in Washington is because people have spoken out. I mean, I think that we have the, really the clearest examples in recent history that activism does matter, that calling your legislators does matter, that showing up at town hall meetings does matter here in California and across the country. And so I think that that's kind of a message that we really, you know, as I said, this is a time to get informed and engaged. And I think that a lot of people are are doing that, and I think that you know we're going to maybe breathe a big sigh of relief if we sustain the Affordable Care Act, but I think that we're really going to have to continue to let people know the impact of you know policies that are coming from Washington, and also a 
hold our state policymakers accountable moving forward as well. And I think that is something that we all can do. For me, I think we can have an impact on changing the narrative. There is uh, this narrative that people on Medicaid are able-bodied people that just refuse to work. And I think we have an opportunity to put a face on the people that are impacted and how tough it is to make ends meet. And uh, that, in fact, this is um, you know, part of the safety net that people need. And I think the other thing that I do want to say is that, for, because there's so many providers in the room, uh, to those of you that are providers, uh, a recommitment to the safety net uh, in some form or fashion uh, would be terrific and would go a long ways. Well, Alina mentioned getting more involved and um, making sure that you are out there and advocating. And there is that piece. There are different ways in which you can be an advocate. You can be an advocate on the national or the state level. You can do what Claire said, which is get out your Rolodex and call everybody in these key states and make sure that they put pressure on their representatives. There is also um, looking not only in the national and the state, but also within your own community helping, volunteering in these clinics, volunteering in these spaces that really need your help right now, supporting these places. It not, may not necessarily just be with money. Maybe it's somebody was telling me about how some, some people came by and they brought a whole bunch of cookies and they gave some flowers and it just made people um, feel better, feel supported. Um, and then also just looking at the individual and how you can help individuals that are in crisis right now. Um, whether it's through volunteering somewhere or whether it's because you find out about something that happens to somebody and you want to help. Someone on my Facebook page, just a woman from my son's, uh, the mother at my son's school, um, heard about or met this one woman who ended up losing her job and her whole entire family was out on the streets in San Francisco. So she took her Facebook page and she said, I know it's only one person, there's all this other stuff that's happening, but can you give money? She did a GoFundMe, and the next thing, like we had, she had about five or six thousand dollars within a 24 hour period. Um, it was only one individual, but she helped that one individual and that family to be able to have a hotel for a week while they tried to figure out what their plan is. Um, and finally, I'd say self care. I think a lot of people are getting very involved and in listening to the news, getting on their Facebook pages, and um, I've been hearing from doc my doctors and my chiropractors like, oh yeah, everybody else we know, they, they can't move their shoulders because they're so tense. Remembering self-care. Um, in the reproductive health and the reproductive justice movement, we've been having to practice this for a long time because we know it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so to remember that and take care of yourself so that you can keep going and um, trying to do these things like get a universal access to health care be able to take care of your patients and um, do the work that you're doing. And I also want to say that I think it's very important to continue affirming the representatives in California and sending them notes. It means a lot to them when they see that 50,000 people have responded to um, any of our senators, any of our representatives, because it's very lonely for them right now in Congress, and it's important for them to be affirmed with what we do, but also to be thinking about how do you reach out to your friends in other parts of the country so that they can be playing an activist role, even if you have to draft the note for them to, with giving them the email address of their state representative um, in Congress. So on that note, I just want to say again, thank you very much for joining us. We're also very interested in continuing to educate uh, the American public about a very complex topic. So thank you so much. <laughs>